Well, good morning. Um, Pastor Mark is actually away this morning with his family, enjoying a little time, uh, kind of recharging and relaxing. So throughout the day, I hope that you'll pray for his, his family as they are away. And on behalf of all the staff here, I want to say a special welcome to a few people. So first, if you are a guest this morning, I want to say that we're really grateful that you've committed your time here to us. And we want you to know that we take your decision to be here with us really seriously. It's our hope that we steward your time well this morning as we point our attention and our affections towards Jesus. To all of our VBS kids, we want to say we're really thankful that you've come back. I know most of them are in the the next room, but we're grateful that they've come back to help remind us to, to look towards Jesus, a God who is indeed here, there, and everywhere. But I want to say a special welcome to all of our VBS volunteers. And here's the thing. I think that my best expression of gratitude to you this morning is just to give each of you full permission to sleep through this entire sermon, okay? (laughs) Full permission. I want to know, have you ever noticed just how much food and eating is present throughout the scriptures? I heard it said once that if you don't get hungry when reading the New Testament, you probably aren't paying attention. And I want you to think about it. From the very beginning of the story, when sin enters into the story, it's through Adam and Eve partaking or or eating of this forbidden fruit. And then there's the Old Testament or the Old Covenant ways of worship. There was the sacrificing of meats and grains and first fruits on the altar to the Lord. There was all these laws and rules about how you would consume food, how you would prepare food. There was the Passover meal. We come into the New Testament and there's even more stories, right? There's the feeding of the 5,000. There's the, the, the disciples breaking the grain heads off on the Sabbath and eating those. There's the Last Supper and it even culminates all the way at the end in Revelations where we see this great marriage banquet, this great marriage feast with all God's people gathered around the table eating together. Food is everywhere in scripture. And here's the thing, it's not on accident. Jesus used food and dining often to turn the cultural norms upside down. And this morning, what Hadley just read for us, we we see in the gospel reading, Jesus is choosing to share a meal with tax collectors and sinners. Now, these are the outsiders. These are the outcasts. These are the others. And I think he did this as a way to show the world, and more particularly in this passage, to show the religious elite just who exactly makes up his kingdom. And here's the thing about food. We all need it. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, if you're high class or low class, if you're in or out, you have to survive and you got to eat to survive. But here's the other thing, who we choose to dine with, who we sit at our tables or who we choose to go sit at their their tables, it communicates much about who we value and who we esteem. So this morning, here's what I'd like for you to do. If you can imagine with me the most incredible banquet table that you've ever seen. And and maybe, maybe that's like a memory that you have from from days gone by. Maybe it was the the meal at your wedding, or maybe it was a, a, a family gathering on Thanksgiving in the past, or maybe you were on a vacation with friends and loved ones. I want you to think about that meal. I want you to remember the emotions that it stirs up in you, and I want you to pay attention to those emotions. Because this morning, I want us to use that imagery of a banquet table, and more specifically, a king's banquet table, as an analogy or an image of our relationship with Christ. But first, let me tell you a story. The last time I stood in this spot and preached, I told you that I have two little girls who absolutely love to hear stories. And this week, as we gathered around the dinner table, I was telling them that I was going to get to preach about my favorite Old Testament story. And with much regret, I realized that my little girls have never asked me to tell them this story. And maybe that's because they can't pronounce the guy's name. You see, my favorite Old Testament story is the story of Mephibosheth. Now, I want you to say that with me. One, two, three, Mephibosheth. That's pretty good. I just, real quick, by, by a show of hands, how many of you have ever had a little one ask you to tell them that story at, at, at bedtime? That's what I figured, yeah. 
So the story goes something like this, and it's 2 Samuel uh, chapter 4 and chapter 9, if you care to follow along. But the story goes something like this. Mephibosheth, who is the son of Jonathan and the grandson of Saul, the king of Israel, when he's about five years old, his father, his grandfather, they go out to war against the Philistines. And during the battle of Gilboa, King Saul, alongside Jonathan and actually two of his brothers, they're struck down. Now, it's important to note the Philistines were not kind, okay? They were not understanding conquerors. In fact, history tells us that the Philistines were ruthless conquerors who often made trophies out of their slain enemies. And now I'm kind of starting to realize why my daughters probably don't want me to tell them this story um, at bedtime. But I want you to imagine the utter fear and chaos that would have ensued in Israel as news that the king and his sons, the successors to the throne, had been killed in such a brutal fashion. And it's in this panic that Mephibosheth's nurse attempts to protect the young boy. She scoops him up, she attempts to flee, and as she's running, somehow the young boy is dropped. And he's injured in such a catastrophic way that it leaves him lame in both of his legs for the rest of his life. Now, I want you to imagine the life of Mephibosheth. Not only is he now an enemy of the state simply because he's got blood relation to the monarchy or the former monarchy, but he's crippled. And in this time in history, it probably would have been better for him to have been dead than disabled. And I'm not sure that us in our modern minds today can really understand the chasm that this would have thrown him into. You know, we have things like the ADA, or there's careers where the physical strength and stamina isn't necessarily required. It's, it's kind of hard for us to imagine the curse that this accident was for this child. Life for Mephibosheth is essentially over. But then the craziest thing happens. A few years later, David is anointed as king. He conquers Jerusalem. He sets about to reestablish the former kingdom of Saul. And here is where the story gets so good. King David, his dearest friend was Jonathan. That's right, Jonathan, the slain father of Mephibosheth. 2 Samuel chapter 9 says this, David, quote, wanting to show kindness for Jonathan's sake, asked if anyone from the house of Saul was left so that David might show them kindness. And it's brought to David's attention that there remains one of Jonathan's sons still alive. And his name is? There you go. You guys are getting pretty good. A son who's crippled in his feet. And with this news, David declares that Mephibosheth shall be carried to the king's table. He shall for the remainder of his days dine as royalty. He shall have the land of his father and his grandfather restored to him and all of his house, including the servants of his father and his grandfather, shall now belong with inside the king's courts. And I tell you this story because this is your story. This is my story. I sometimes feel just like Mephibosheth. I can't really recall when the breaking happened, but I just know that I'm not right. And in the case of Mephibosheth, because of this fall, something he had nothing to do with, he's broken. His whole life is turned upside down. But the beauty is because of nothing he had done, nothing he could earn, Nothing he did to deserve it, simply because of who his father was. The king invited him to the table, seated him in a seat that he didn't deserve. And friends, this is our story of our relationship with Jesus. We realize that we're deeply broken. We realize that the king has carried us to his table. He has seated us in a seat that we don't deserve. He has blessed us for eternity and it changes Everything. It literally changes everything. Nothing in this world will ever be the same. One of the ways that I love to envision this relationship is actually regularly coming into this room with you, coming to this altar, to this table, and taking communion. It just helps me to sort of remember my story. It helps me remember the seat that's been prepared for me. And I love this line that's in the Kenyan 
Anglican book of common prayer. It's their liturgy for their service. And right before communion, there's this line that the pastor reads. It says, brothers and sisters, we have sung God's praise. We've listened and responded to his word. We have prayed for others, confessed our sins, received his forgiveness and peace. And through these acts, the Holy Spirit prepares you and me to offer ourselves to our Father in heaven to be taken, blessed, broken, and given. And this morning, with the remaining time I have, I'd like to suggest that this fourfold pattern, being taken, blessed, broken, and given, is actually the Spirit's movement in our lives. This is what we see happen in the story of Mephibosheth. And for those of us who call Jesus Lord, this is what happens in our life. This is our story too. The first word is taken. Now, I'm actually going to shift it just a little bit. I really prefer the word chosen. I think it communicates a little bit more clearly. A few years ago, um, after all us kids were out of the house and my parents had empty, entered into the, the beautiful empty nest stage, my mom and dad decided to become foster parents and take on two young foster children. These two kids were the victim of a home where there was no stability. Substance abuse had a stranglehold on both their mother and father. And although they never said it, it was clear to us that these two boys weren't really sure that they were wanted. Now, for a year, they lived with my mom and dad, and in that year, it was truly life-changing for them. My mom and dad and their CASA worker, they provided support and stability and structure that these two boys needed to thrive. But I wanna tell you, everything changed when a family friend of ours looked those two little boys in the eyes and said, we choose you to be our sons forever. I kid you not, not only did the emotional and mental state of these two little boys change, even their physical appearance changed once they knew that they had been chosen. And this is what we see in Mephibosheth. He's chosen. And this is what happens to you and me. We've been chosen. And it is actually this dramatic. It changes us. I love how one writer puts it. It says, my deepest awareness of myself is that I'm deeply loved by Jesus Christ and I have done nothing to deserve it. And look, as we come to this awareness that we've been chosen and that it's not by our own merit, it shapes the way that we see others. We begin to take on the eyes of Jesus Christ and in his kingdom, please hear me clearly, there is no room for racism. There is no room for sexism. There is no room for classism. There is no room for political partyism. Looking down on others because of where they were born or what they've done or what they have to offer you and me. In fact, I am convinced that among the countless people standing in front of the throne of the Lamb, dressed in white robes, holding palms in their hand and worshiping the Lord as described in Revelation chapter seven, I shall see prostitutes who could find no other employment and did whatever they had to do to feed their children. I think I'll see a woman who made a decision to terminate her pregnancy and every day is haunted by the guilt and the remorse, but did what she had to do faced with grueling alternatives. I think I'll see a businessman who sold his integrity in a series of desperate transactions. I think I'll see a pastor who was addicted to being liked. He never pushed his people and he longed for unconditional love. I think I'll see a deathbed convert who for decades had his cake and ate it too, broke every law of God and man and wallowed in the abuse of the earth. And I can literally see it on some of your faces now. What? No, not those people. But that's the thing about the Lord's table. It's a table of grace. It has nothing to do with what we've done or what we have left undone. We've been chosen. We've been invited. And for those of us who accept the invitation, those of us who willingly sit in the presence of the Lord and proclaim him as king, our robes have been washed as white as snow in the blood of the lamb. And friends, if this is not good news to us, we have never truly understood the gospel of grace. 
The second action is blessed. And our English word blessing actually is derived from the same word as benediction. And benediction literally just means speaking well. So each week at the end of our service, when our pastors stand before us and they speak a benediction over us, they're, they're just speaking well of you. They're speaking a blessing over you. And there's this powerful moment in the story of Mephibosheth as he's standing face to face to King David. And I love how Eugene Peterson puts it in his message translation. It says, shuffling and stammering, not looking him in the eye, Mephibosheth said, who am I that you'd pay attention to a stray dog like me? You see, Mephibosheth had bought into the narrative of the world that he was useless, that he's nothing more than a stray mutt. And in this moment, King David names Mephibosheth rightly. He says, you're not a dog, you're a son of the king. And I believe that there's no such thing as a middle-class Christian. Either you're a pauper or you're a princess. Either you are a poverty-stricken beggar or you're a prince who's been seated at the king's table. There is no in-between. But the problem is, is that you and I forget that we've been named rightly by the Lord. We forget that we have a new identity and we're tempted to live into the nicknames that the world gives us. We're tempted to believe that the title of single or married or divorced is what defines us. We're we're tempted to believe that it's employed or unemployed or employable that defines us. We're tempted to believe it's fat or fit or rich or successful or failure or on and on and on, that those are our true names. And we forget that we've been seated at the king's table, but not only that, he's looked at us and he has said, child son, daughter, heir. But this too has implications for how we live. We now have the responsibility to rightly name those around us. I read a recent psychology study that said, depending on how active your brain is, you have somewhere between 40 to 60,000 thoughts per day. And 70% of those are negative. Furthermore, it takes three positive thoughts or experiences to overcome one negative one. And why do I tell you these stats? I I, I tell you this because this is why we're so tempted to live into and believe the nicknames that the world gives us. But furthermore, and maybe more importantly, I want you to hear me say it's not just our challenge as Christians. All of the world is struggling with this. So the question becomes, so what do we do? Well, first, just real pragmatically, I think, especially as we prepare to enter into another election cycle, I think some of us just need to take a break from social media because it is literally coloring the way that we see a particular group of people. And I want you to ask yourself, do I name that person or those people with a gospel name or am I tempted to give them a nickname? Do I call them God's creation or do I call them fill in the blank? Secondly, we have to speak up. We have to name people correctly. And for some of us, that means actually confessing our sins of naming wrongly and actually asking those people for forgiveness. For others, it just means making time to rightly name someone. And parents, I wanna talk to you for one second. Have you ever intentionally sat your child down and told them boldly and courageously who they are to you? Have you ever told them what you truly think about them? And be specific. And I will guarantee if you speak blessing over your children, it will be life-giving in ways that you can't imagine. And look, I don't care if your child's a two-year-old like mine or if you have a 62-year-old. We are all children and we need to hear our parents speak blessing over us. But what about those of us who don't have children. Maybe your person to speak blessing over is a sister or a cousin or a neighbor or a coworker, or what about your pastors? No, they didn't pay me to say this. When's the last time that you spoke blessing over them or their families? Like Mephibosheth, we've been named rightly. We are no longer dog, but we are now royalty. And we have this incredible privilege and responsibility to now bless others to name them rightly, and to speak well. Our third movement is the word broken. Now, 
not only is our relationship with Christ a place of grace, but it's a place of healing. It's a place of mercy. And at his table, this is where broken yet forgiven sinners come alongside other broken yet forgiven sinners to receive and remember God's forgiveness, to be changed by it, and as a result, to live a life that is filled with the gospel and grace. And here's the thing. This might be the most important thing I say for some of us all morning. Like Mephibosheth, we don't have to make sure we're all cleaned up and healed up before we come to the table, because the fact is, we can't. It was impossible for Mephibosheth to fix himself before coming into the king's court. And I want you to notice something. The king never asked him to. For some of us, our wounds are self-inflicted. We've caused the pain in our marriage. We've embraced the addiction. We've traded our integrity and character for worldly success. And it's important. We must own our missteps and not gloss over the pain that we've caused to ourselves or others. But for so many of us, the pain and the hurt that is in our lives, we have no responsibility for. Somewhere along the way, the world dropped us and everything seems upside down. And all I can tell you is Christ beckons, come to me and I will give you rest. In Christ, we don't have to hide our wounds. In fact, there's a balm that the Lord offers and it's a balm of healing and peace. Still, I, I want to be honest for a minute, and maybe this is just the millennial in me, but the places where I've revealed my wounds to the Father and asked for healing, there are still scars in my life. I, no, the, the fact is, he's been faithful to heal me. There's no doubt about it. But sometimes those places still hurt, or maybe they're still a little sensitive. So what do we do? Well, first, I think we face it head on. We own to ourselves, to the Lord, and to Christian community the hurt that we feel. And secondly, we place it under blessing. We remember that we have been named rightly, and no matter the severity of our pain, it will not define us. And lastly, we embrace this role as wounded healer. I find it interesting, but not surprising, that 75% of all counselors Therapists, psychologists have experienced significant trauma or pain or suffering at some point in their life. And through their own process of healing, they've been able to offer healing to others. And when, when I think about this term, uh, wounded healer, I think of people like Nadia Murad. She was the Iraqi Yazidi Nobel Peace Prize recipient. Nadia was the victim of kidnapping and assault at the hands of ISIS. And she's used her own trauma and experiences to advocate and fight for victims of genocide, to bring awareness of sexual violence as a weapon of war. Or people like Christopher Reeves, right, Mr. Superman, in his advocacy for individuals suffering from spinal cord injuries. Now, my wounds, my story is not as dramatic as these examples. And maybe yours are, or maybe yours are like mine, but I hope that no matter what, we'll own them for the good of the world. We have to be real about our wounds. And if you've been the victim of abuse or neglect or addiction, those things will be with you until the Lord returns and sets things aright. And I have to admit that's sometimes really difficult for me to embrace but we have been given new life. And we do have a Holy Spirit who aids us even in the hardest and darkest parts of our lives. And if we're willing, the Lord wants to use us as broken vessels to hold and contain the healing and peace for others in the world. And this is what brings me to my last point. We are to be given. One of the most consistent themes throughout scripture is that God has poured out his blessing on his people so that therefore they would go and bless the world. This is the example given to us by Jesus. He gave his life for me and for you so that we would therefore go and give our lives for the sake of others. And there's this portion in the story of Mephibosheth that I think oftentimes gets overlooked. And I think it's tragic because it might be one of the most important parts of the story. When King David brings Mephibosheth to his table, there's life-changing implications for all the people around him. 
Not only does Mephibosheth's family come into the king's court, but the former servant of Saul and Jonathan's homes are also brought into the kingdom. And scripture says that King David ordered the land of Saul and Jonathan to be returned to Mephibosheth and that Ziba, the former servant of Saul, was to oversee the land, produce, and wealth of his new master, Mephibosheth. Scripture also tells us Ziba's household included 15 sons and numerous servants. And just because Mephibosheth was seated at the king's table, all of their life is now changed for the better. My question to myself and to you this morning is, if we've been seated at the king's table, what proof is there in the world around us? Have we made anyone's life any different? And if I'd be really honest, there's a question that sort of haunts me, is that if I was to move away today, would I really be missed in my spheres of influence? Would, would the people who live on Roan's Quarter Road and Tyler really know that I was gone? Would the parents at Brown Elementary or Kids Kaleidoscope even know that I was missing? Would I leave lives here at Marvin any for the better? Have I really given myself away? Have you given yourself away? And in the same way that Jesus, he took the bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to feed those gathered around the Passover table. We are taken, we are blessed, we are broken, and we are given to be food to the world. And I guess the thing that I want us to consider is that are we surrounded by people in our lives who are feasting well? Or are there people who are malnourished and starving because we're hoarding all the good of our lives to ourselves? My youngest daughter, Anna, when she was a baby, she was like this ferocious eater. We lovingly referred to her as the garbage disposal. And I did tell her I was gonna say that before I was saying it to you. And it didn't matter what you put in front of her. It didn't matter what quantities, she would just consume it in rapid fashion. And you, and you better keep that stream of food coming or you were gonna feel the, the wrath of sweet Anna, okay? But Anna was also one of these babies who needed to just be aware of everything around her. And when we would go to dinner, she would often spend the majority of the meal turned around in her high chair, facing out towards all the other patrons. Parents, do you understand what I'm talking about? It did not matter how good the company was at our table. It didn't matter how good the food was. She would face the world and face away from our table. And I remember there was one evening at dinner, I tried over and over and over to get her to turn and face our table and it hit me that this is often how I eat at the Lord's table. I have been seated in a seat of honor with a feast worthy of royalty laid out before me. I have been invited to be present at the king's table and instead I am so distracted by all the things in the world around me. I've got some serious FOMO and it means that I'm tempted to chase after things that aren't fulfilling. I'm tempted to live into nicknames that are not true. And I'm tempted to hoard my food just for me. So this morning, if you've never accepted the invitation to surrender yourself to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and pull your chair up to the table, our pastoral staff will be here down front and they would love an opportunity to talk and pray with you. Maybe this morning you need to confess to the Lord the nicknames that you've been living under and actually ask him to speak your true name. Maybe you need to confess the ways that you've wrongly been naming others and ask the Holy Spirit to help you bless them instead. Maybe this morning you feel broken and like Mephibosheth, you need deep and real healing. And what I would say is calm down, come to the altar, come and kneel, find one of our pastors, allow the Lord to start the healing process. Or maybe the reminder you need is that we've been given life so that we, we give it away for the sake of others. Whichever movement that you need to be reminded of in the Lord's table, and maybe, maybe it's all of them, whatever he's stirring in your heart, here's my plea, hear me out. Stay present, stay attentive at the table. Don't turn away. The feast is laid out in front of you and it's good. It's better than anything else around you. Lean in, let God begin moving 
and molding your life. Let's pray. God, we surrender ourselves to you. We admit that while we have been pulled up, bellied up to the table, oftentimes we are just so distracted by the things around us. God, so remind us what good feast sets before us. Remind us of the blessing that you have spoken over our lives. Remind us that you're a God who knows the deepest wounds that we carry and have the balm to heal us and set us aright. And Lord, finally, would you help us to live into an ethic of abundance, not an ethic of scarcity, that we don't have to hold things tight, but yet we can give ourselves and give our things away for the sake of the world. Make us more like you, Jesus. Pour out your spirit on us. And remind us that we've been carried to a table seated in a seat that we don't deserve. We pray this in your name. Amen.